an imperial throne, a samovar of the Shah of Iran, an antique Victorian carriage, handmade carpets, an antique grand piano, a witness of the performance of the great masters, dozens of antique clocks that have been counting down the time for centuries, and numerous exclusive art objects that can be the object of desire not only for famous collectors, but even well-known museums of the world. All these most expensive collectibles from different corners of the world met, and for almost a quarter of a century, harmoniously intertwined in the life of Saulia Kobzhanova's family. And it all started with a samovar. Samovar, a large metal container used to boil water for tea with a firebox filled with coals inside. Love for art was instilled in me early on during childhood thanks to my parents. My sister graduated from Repin Academy of Arts. She studied in St. Petersburg, and I used to visit her quite often during those distant Soviet times. Each time I was mesmerized by the abundance of cultural heritage showcased in St. Petersburg. We went to all the museums, attended all the exhibitions. Apparently, that was the time when my craving for art came to light. Later on, I graduated from the Department of Graphic Arts. As for the story of samovars, it all began rather matter-of-factly. One day, my father brought his mom's samovar from Kostanai, where he is from originally. It's an absolutely wonderful samovar. It's not here, it always stands in my dad's room always in the most honorable place. It's his mother's samovar, my grandmother's, whom I didn't get to know in person, unfortunately. It's the only memory that was left of her. It is a classic jar samovar with medals. My dad bought it when it seemed at the time he felt a little lonely. Well, for some reason, we thought we started to buy and add some items to it trays, cups, drip pans. Then we bought another samovar and another one in order to create a composition, so it would all come together beautifully. Later on, we purchased more and more, and the collection expanded, while we started to develop a taste for it. With each newly acquired samovar, another curious story gracefully entered their abode. While studying antiques, for a brief moment, Saule's family became witnesses of someone's relationships, traditions and customs of distant countries. These are English samovars right here. All English samovars were using kettlebells. They didn't use charcoal samovars because they took care of their tablecloths. Kettlebell samovars work the following way. The water was poured into the samovar, a kettlebell was heated and then placed in a special pipe to maintain the temperature. These medals come from suppliers to the imperial court. It was Batash. Actually, there were two of them, Batashev and Shamarin. Because of the exceptional quality of their work, they got the right to place the Russian Empire coat of arms on their samovars. Sometimes at exhibitions, they received medals, which they placed on their products. Here's a marvelous Shamarin samovar made for the Shah of Persia. It says right here, such abundance of medals, you see. All samovars are of unique shape. Apparently this one was commissioned. The one you're recording right now, you can see that it has bone handles. The handle grips are made from ivory. The samovar is called Persian because of its shape. This is a lovely vase. The samovar here is quite unique. It's got pig feet. You can see the resemblance in the shape. And here is a Fergé samovar. Now I want to draw your attention to this interesting fact. In some of our industry, same as in the car industry, there are samovars made exclusively for the royal family. Some of the samovars here were quite expensive and as a rule distributed among the noble houses. But there were some pieces that were created exclusively for the aristocracy because they were luxurious. One of such factories was the company belonging to the Hannibert brothers. Their samovar is displayed here. You see, it has a monogram testifying its belonging to an aristocratic family. See, it has feet in the form of lion's paws. It's covered in such abundance of rich elements, lavishly decorated with branches and garlands, all of which indicate power and luxury. Let's say it's a Rolls Royce. Like a Rolls Royce is well considered among cars, this Hennebeck samovar is also highly regarded among samovars. 
I wanted to show you the highlight of our collection. I was absolutely shocked when I purchased this particular samovar. It's our Kazakh samovar, the original one. You can witness the same kind of Kumgan samovar in the paintings of Kastiev and Hludov, where they are depicted right beside the yurt. Did you know that in the 70s of the 18th century, a stroller was considered a symbol of family status in Europe and the USA? It was a must-have item for aristocrats and then for the middle class too. The stroller was quite expensive and not every family could afford such a purchase as late as the beginning of the 20th century. Later, it was replaced by a baby doll stroller, which was also difficult to buy, thus not available to everyone. Strollers were made of wood and vines using expensive brass fixtures. These objects of children's amusement were art masterpieces. Models were given royal names, princes, duchess, and some were even named after royal castles, Balmoral, Windsor, and others. Children no longer play with such toys, but they are still very expensive as many years ago. And it is not easy to find these strollers, you can only come across them in museums or private collections. And as it turned out, there are some in Kazakhstan as well. These ones were purchased all over Europe. What's amazing is that they are in full working condition. The wheels spin, the hood goes up and closes, everything functions properly. They were made of forged metal, wood and vines, all handmade. None of the shapes are the same, all unique, completely different in sizes. It's absolutely amazing. They're displayed on the other side as well. You can see for yourself how original they all are, how elaborately made. Well, that's my kind of love right here. I love them so much. These strollers were created all over Europe. They're available for purchase both in Europe and in the UK. I even have them with the original mattresses. You can see how lovely they are and all in working condition. My daughter adored them. She always used to roll them around. Now she's eight years old. Well, as long as she was little, she used to be interested in strollers and always played with these ones. They are of very different sizes, different modifications, but none of them look similar because they're all handmade. One day, I bought just one piece. Then I liked it so much that it went on and on. So here they are, look, in various shapes and forms. Three-wheeled strollers, tiny strollers, whatever kind you want. Walking through Saulet's house, you sometimes forget that you're not in a museum. Some of ours and baby strollers are harmoniously lit next to each other in one room. From there, we get to the office where Saulet usually performs her duties of a main work. She is a lawyer and she works on cases sitting at this unique table, which may have once belonged to a Chinese emperor. We go further on, into the hall, then into the living room. Look, this is a chair from the throne room. That's the king and queen. This is exactly what it is, the throne room, furniture that came from a castle. And all of it is in front of a 19th century painting. The king and queen are depicted here, as you can see. It's a pair of furniture pieces, perfect feng shui. Almost nothing resembles any house we are used to living in today. But Saulé and her family can't imagine their life any other way. Here, every evening they light candles in ancient bronze chandeliers, brew a delicious drink in a porcelain teapot made by the hands of a master in the century before last. And the old grand piano quietly shares its unique sounds harmoniously intertwined with the rhythms of the hands of a hundred clocks. Saulé brought them from different countries, as well as books. Her library include eight volumes of the collection of the famous 1829 traveler, Brian.
I'm truly proud of my carpet collection. Kazakh carpets hold special place in my heart. They're completely unique items of handmade art. I choose not to call it handicraft production. I consider it art, really. What I'd like to point out is that Kazakh carpets themselves are unique because they were never produced for sale. All these carpets were woven for some great, special, joyful events. A grandmother or a mother would weave it for the birth of a grandchild, a wedding or an anniversary. Therefore, as a rule, they are all dated and signed, dedicated to the person whom they were created for. Can you imagine? We're sitting here among all this beauty and diversity which was created within two, three or even six months. And it was made with love, good intentions and wishes. If you take a closer look at these carpets, you can notice very diverse patterns of animals, Kazakh ornaments and flowers. There are carpets that were copied. Do you remember those Indian tea cans with lions, tigers, deer? The women who wove this brought in everything they knew into these carpets. All these beautiful, agile animals, amazing flowers. С оленями, то есть все, что могли эти женщины, которые их ткали, вот они в эти ковры привнесли всех этих животных ловких, красивых цветы. Here, unfortunately, Bidaigul is hidden beneath. There are wheat ears depicted on the carpet for prosperity. The ornaments are never repeated. This is the uniqueness of the Kazakh carpet. I think it's something we should be proud of. In fact, Kazakh carpets are our cultural heritage. Every object in Saulet's house is not just a work of art, but a real mute witness to the years gone by, to the grand and small events of a certain country, to the traditions and values of a certain family. And it is an important fact that every object in this house, despite the distance in time, has found its own way to Saulet's house. I sense these kind of things. To be honest, I didn't buy what I didn't want. I mean, I always bought things only from good hands. If it was Europe, it was from a good household, not a bankrupt one. I did not buy things that were associated with difficult situations. For example, some antiques were taken from families because of their debts. I didn't wish to buy such items. It's not for me. I considered some pieces that were, let's say, sold because an owner of some European castle decided to turn it into a hotel and sell the furniture. By the way, it was a common practice some years ago. Then you're welcome, I'm definitely buying it. But if it has bad history of debts, bankruptcy and misfortunes, then no. Like I said, that's the thing about guns. I don't collect guns because they were used for their intended purpose, however beautiful they might be. Guns are often a real work of art, but they are not my thing. What's important for me is the so-called energy of the item. It must be pleasant. It must serve well and function properly. I don't like broken things. When I buy something, I don't restore it. Everything I have is in pristine condition. I can demonstrate these items and share their stories. There are many things I can show. I think that must be my mission, because I preserved them. Saulia knows every piece in her collection, not just where and when it was acquired, but its entire history. And most importantly, Saulia breathes new life into each piece, using them in everyday life and introducing them to her guests. Thank you.